Welcome, everybody, to the third broadcast, Sustainability Happy Hour. I'm one of your co-hosts, Pat Keyes, lead scientist at the School of Global Environmental Sustainability, and this is... My name is Micah. I am the communications specialist at the School of Global Environmental Sustainability. Uh, and I'm going to start telling you fun facts about myself during the introduction portion Ooh. of this. So to this week's fun fact is that I started growing a garden for the first time this year. Um, and in your life? Well, I grew up, my parents had a garden, but this yeah. is the first one I've ever done like by myself. Oh, um, great. So that's very exciting. Growing? Oh, so growing? many, so many things. And I actually have a, a show and tell piece to give you today. Um, I sprouted, I sprouted some cucumbers and broccoli from seeds and I'm going to go and transplant look at that. these. Look at that, like very clever. Hold on. Can you like just tilt it without spilling all the dirt out? Is that an egg? That's an egg carton. It's it? an egg carton. Yep. What a good idea. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to go plant these this weekend. It's yeah. Be great. That is, so can I make, uh, as a master gardener, um, I'm not, by the way. I am, I'm not a master gardener. My mom is a master gardener. She just Dang, got My certified. dad is a master gardener. Yeah, he's, so like, call... <laughs> he's like, so how, how deep are you actually planting your seeds? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'm putting them in the dirt, you know? like Putting some more dirt on top. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Anyways, but that's I, my fun I, fact for the week. <laughs> I found out the hard way, though, if you don't, like, when you transfer your sprouted seeds and you let all the dirt fall away from, like, whatever mm. nascent roots you have, mm -hmm. that it just, like, immediately just goes like this. Yeah, that's not like good. Like it loses like some sort of pressure or something in the root system. Yeah. So like keep it together when you plant it. That'll help. Okay. Good to know. That's, yeah. I mean, I mean, you probably shouldn't take my advice though, because every year I go to like great lengths and plant three garden boxes. And then by around, I don't know, week four, everything's dead. So except I, the weeds, except the yeah, weeds. Yeah. Yeah. I think you need to call your dad is what you need to do. <laughs> I, I should call my dad more in general. Uh, if you're watching dad, I'll give you a call soon, okay? Sorry. Um, okay, so what are we gonna talk about? What are we talking about today? Okay, so wait, today we have uh, a special guest, Jenna Parker. We're gonna bring her on in a few minutes. Um, and it's gonna actually be a really cool interview, I think. Uh, she studied to ele elephants. Elephants? Is that you know, a word? What? I think I'm going to start calling them elephants. Okay. Um, no, I'm not. Um, she studied a little bit of orphaned elephants, so there might be some ugly crying um, around that uh, later on. Makes me very uh, sad. But she studied, she studied more than that, but I'm sure I'm going to ask some orphaned elephant questions, and then I might leave for a little while um, and go cut some onions and come back. Um, but let's start with a little news segment. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're, we're maybe a little bit behind on the times, but... Uh, graduation did happen last Yay! week. So congratulations to all of the graduates. You know, we've got um, a bunch of so just minors that have graduated. Um, and so we want to make sure that we extend a heartfelt congratulations to them, especially since this year, you know, all the ceremonies uh, have been postponed. And so there's not as much pomp and circumstance. Um, but this year we have grads in all four of our focused minors. Uh, we've got the Global oh, nice. Environmental Sustainability minor. There's a Sustainable Water Interdisciplinary minor. There's yep, swim. the Swim, yep. There's um, the, sustainable, the Role of Sustainability in Peace and Reconciliation Studies minor, and then the yeah. Sustainable Energy minor. So this spring we had 70 graduates. Congratulations to all of you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we've got some really remarkable graduates uh, this semester. Um, we're graduating students from all eight colleges. Um, we've got students that are magna cum laude, summa cum laude, and cum laude holy at CSU. Holy. Yeah, so we got some smart cookies with us. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to share what my grades were in undergrad. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we're really proud of all of them, um, and we're so excited to see how they go change the world. So yeah, no congrats. Kidding. Uh, Keep congrats, in touch. graduates. Yes. Yeah. Tell us all the cool things you're doing uh, so yeah, we can brag about you later on. Yeah. Um, next up in news is that we've got a couple of uh, articles to talk about today. The first one is uh, an article about COVID 19. So I know we, um, you know, that's not all we want to talk about, but it is definitely still on the forefront of things. And I found this really interesting article um, from preventionweb.net. 
And that is the, um, it's managed by the United Nations Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, mm. And so that's where this article came from. And it's called Addressing Climate Change in a Post-Pandemic World. So the article really went into how there are a lot of similarities between pandemics and climate change. Um, they're both systemic um, in that they uh, affect various parts of society. Um, they're non-stationary, non-linear, and regressive. Regressive meaning that they affect um, uh, they affect different populations differently and people that are already at risk for other types of um, either oppression or poor health are going to be more affected by both pandemics and climate change. Absolutely. Um, and it also talks about the differences. The main one being that COVID-19 feels like a very acute crisis. Um, it's very tangible. It's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And along with that, we're able to see relatively quickly the consequences of our actions. So think about flattening the curve. Um, you know, we all quarantined and the curve flattened. And so we can point to that and say, look at, here's this cause and effect. Whereas with climate I mean, yeah, change- an immediate, like an immediate effect. Yeah, and an right. immediate effect. Whereas with climate change, it still all seems so far away that it's harder for people to grasp. And even um, if we did everything right, you know, like even if we did everything right, it would still probably take a decade for us to see that sort of reaction in like the interconnected climate system. So right. like, we, we expect results yesterday and we won't get them for 10 years. That's going to be really hard. Yeah. Humans are so wired for that instant gratification and they have that, that future self bias. Um, yeah. And so kind of ending in that article, it talked about how moving forward with both um, moving forward from COVID-19 and in uh, terms of solutions for climate change, um, we're going to have to build in climate change policies into these recovery efforts. So there's yeah. all the all the steps that are being taken for economic recovery. And if we don't include green policies and have climate change at the forefront of those efforts, then um, it's not going to be a good time. It's not going to be a good time. Um, I wanted to ask you, Pat, I know you're teaching a systems thinking class um, in the upcoming semester. And to me, this all sort of smells like systems thinking. Um, what does, like, do you have anything from that perspective? Well, I would, I would respond with everything is systems thinking. <laughs> um, but that's pretty tautological. So, um, yeah, so from a systems thinking perspective, I think it, you have to be able to think about kind of cause and effect. Um, and then other big concepts in systems thinking are things like feedbacks and time lags, as well as spatial lags. So with climate change and especially climate change policies and then the effects of those policies, um, or hopefully the positive consequences of those policies, there would be huge time lags, at least as far as our kind of normal perceptions are concerned. And so, yeah, from a systems thinking perspective, climate change poses a really thorny problem in that, in that um, it's really hard to tackle and overcome those time lags. Um, and I think, I'm not sure what the research space is like around that, but there's gotta be a lot of work that's being done. Maybe mm -hmm. we can try and find somebody in a, another broadcast in the future to talk with about that, because that's a really cool idea or uh, a really chewy concept, you, you could say. Um, let's see, what's another, what's another piece of news that we could share before we bring Jenna, Jenna in? Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to, you know, a positive piece of news. Yeah, um, like so some good news to end this section with um, is that Seed by Seed, a women's collective helps reforest Brazil uh, Zingu River Basin. Uh, I found this on right. mangabay.org, which is- Wait, a, how do you say that? How do you say that? The river basin? It doesn't, doesn't matter. I don't actually. <laughs> I thought you said it like it just like came out. So I assumed you were like you practiced like you looked it up on like. No, if you com. if you say something with enough confidence and you don't pause afterwards, people are going to yeah. assume you said it correctly. Unless there's a jerk here who's like, how do you say that word? <laughs> Unless there's a jerk in a floral print print shirt on the other side Is of the it screen. Floral? I don't know. I can't see it from here. Yeah, it's floral. I'm just kidding. So, anyways, this was a really cool article. <laughs> um, I need to get to my notes here in a second. Um, so good, you've got it pulled up. Um, yep. Mangabay.org um, is a uh, nonprofit that uh, writes and aggregates environmental news. Um, they started in 1999. 
I just like to give the sources that we're reading from just mm-hmm. so that, you know, we're not like reading from tabloids. Um, so the Yarang women's movement in Brazil um, is a collective of women that are working to reforest this deforested area. And they've collected 3.2 tons of seeds over the past decade. Um, what they do is they take those seeds and then they sell them to rural landowners and organizations to help replenish forests. And so this is a double win. Um, it's yeah. creating economic independence for these women. Um, and then it's also helping to reforest this area. Um, they're responsible for replanting nearly 6,000 uh, hectares, uh, which is about 14,000, almost 15,000 acres of land wow. in this river basin. Um, and so what's really exciting is that they're, you know, this work is being done. They're continuing this work. Um, climate change and the way that it's affecting when these different tree species are um, dropping seeds is making the work more difficult. It's making um, their collecting times more unpredictable, um, but they're going to keep at it, which yeah. is really cool. That's great. Oh, and there's a video. We're not going to watch that right now, but you, you should go watch the video. Yeah, it is. It's a really interesting video. So this time um, we say this every show, but this time we're definitely going to include all these links in the show notes, like underneath the YouTube video uh, afterwards. Yes. Yep. It's going to be because great. I mean, frankly, our millions of viewers are clamoring for this information. And it is millions. It is up it's in the millions. millions. Definitely millions. Yeah. Um. Okay, so should we should we bring in our our guests now? Let's do it. I'm ready. You never said cheers, so let's say cheers when Jenna shows up. How about? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, okay. Well, oh, and Jenna. just so you know, I, I bef- I'm gonna get I'm gonna get my my hand slapped if I don't say anything. This is not a floral print shirt. This is an Aloha shirt. I see. A a close colleague of mine uh, from Hawaii ha- told me after the last show when I was referring to it as um a hawaiian shirt he's like actually it's an aloha shirt so mm, i did uh, not know pretty, that yeah well that's i i think that's just what it's called in hawaii mm-hmm. uh, but given that we're calling them hawaiian shirts we should probably use the word that i don't know uh, no, i'm gonna call fair. it an aloha shirt okay but without further ado let's toggle this away and let's welcome uh jenna you ready thumbs up good ready set go boom bringing you on all right. Hey. Welcome, Jenna. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to and be cheers. here. Cheers. Cheers. I have LaCroix. <laughs> LaCroix. I, I have water it's, with mint in a jar. It's nice. BYOB. Bring your own beverage. Everything goes. <laughs> good. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So maybe we could start off just by you um, introducing yourself and kind of just uh, giving like a quick kind of backstory of who you are. Yeah. Um, So right now I am a PhD candidate in Dr. George Wittemeyer's lab in the Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Department at Colorado State University. And um, George has headed up a long-term research project on elephants in northern Kenya for the past 22 years. Um, And so I came and joined to look at the effects of orphaning on elephants. So the population where I work from about 2009 to 2014 experienced quite a high degree of poaching and there was also a drought. So many adult elephants died and they're recovering now. The poaching has slowed and um, they're doing much better, but we want to see what the lasting indirect impacts of poaching are. So look at um, what happens for orphan elephants in comparison to non-orphans in terms of I'm, I collected, what this comes down to is I collected a ton of dung from known orphans and non-orphans in the population. And I'm going to compare um, stress levels and I have compared parasite levels, worm loads, and um, we'll be looking at bacteria differences, potential bacteria differences. And then um, I'm also doing some modeling to see if orphaning affects overall population growth. Is there anything else specific that you would 
like me to cover? Hold on a second. I'm trying okay. to get back to the screen. Here we go. Um, <laughs> I'm still learning all these little things that I can like toggle you to be the big screen and then go back and forth. And so I'm trying to learn how to do that. So, okay. So that's a lot of stuff going on. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot of field work, right? Yes. And um, I mean, I don't want to dwell on this part, but you're analyzing dung. Mm -hmm. Maybe like, what does that actually mean? Okay, and well, what, what I, is the technical term? Do you say dung in the lab mm -hmm. or? Yeah, okay. dung. Nice. Um, what it meant for me was sitting with, so we know all the elephants apart. I had to learn them all apart because they have different ear markings and different tusk configurations. Whoa. Like how, can you just be like, oh, that's Hank. Now I can, well, but it takes a couple months to be able to do that. But Well, it's um, not going to be Hank either because you're not looking at male elephants, right? Right, right. Part. It's yeah. true. We have no Hanks, but um, yeah, <laughs> Soutine or I'm trying to think of some other names, T. Hannah. I can say that's them. But I would sit with, so um, we know which are orphans because all the elephants were known before the poaching started and everything. So I picked about 40 orphan and non orphan subjects, and wow. then I would sit with them and wait for them to defecate for yeah. hours on end during the day which is actually really fun because you're just sitting and hanging out with elephants and then you have how to... close are you they get really close they're used to the researchers now so some will come up and scratch themselves on the car or come up and the calves are very fascinated with the antennas a lot of times they'll grab it with their trunk and things yeah no um, doubt but okay. then when they defecate, you have to get out and collect the dung. And sometimes they're still around. So you have to be very careful. And I've had to army crawl and grab some dung and run back in the car. But I ended up with um, quite a few samples, about 800. Okay. And, um, 800? Yeah. <laughs> and we, <laughs> I was out there for over a year. Holy and um, so now... And we repeatedly collected from the same individuals, which should help with, um, like, if there were acute stressors, if an elephant was spooked right. by something right before I collected its dung, hopefully we can get average levels and um, mm. that will be averaged out, so to speak. Yeah. But um, I'm not doing it there. The samples are in the lab and I'm collaborating with some other people who know how to extract glucocorticoids and things. So I'm not doing okay. the lab work as much, um, but I collected all of the dung. You collected, you did the hard part. And I'll do the analysis too, but yeah. So, so um, to kind of roll back a little bit, I did a little, I mean, I'm not a journalist. Um, <laughs> I think I take. I think I took a journalism class in high school, maybe. Anyway, so I tried to prep though for this interview, and um, I went on your website, which is awesome, by the way. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> and and you have you've apparently written like a ton of blog articles, like in addition to publications and stuff. You've got a bunch of blog writing, uh, which is in and of itself really hard to do, right? I mean, that's a completely different kind of writing. Yeah. I enjoy that writing more, though. Oh, okay. It comes a bit more naturally to me than the scientific writing. But I'm getting better at the science writing, I think. Well, and hope. I mean, hats off. I mean, <laughs> oh, because personally, you. like when you have to toggle between, <laughs> hey, look at that, hats off. Uh, uh, we didn't plan that. Uh, that was awesome. <laughs> but, but when you toggle between like a mode of scientific communication and then communication for, you know, um, an interested audience, but not maybe a science audience, that's a different mode of communication. So I don't know. I just wanted to say like really good job because the writing oh, thank is, you. is quite good. But I did note that in one of them, like back in 2015, you had said that like you were an intern in Samburu, Kenya, which is in central Kenya. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, and you, you'd said that you hoped to work with George Wittemeyer, right? Yeah. So at the time you didn't know you were going to work with, with, uh, and we should, like professor at CSU, um, but now you are. And so maybe can you like trace that path a little bit to be like you started as an intern in Samburu um, writing about this, you know, work that you were already doing with elephants, which is fantastic. And then trace that thread all the way to the present day. Yeah. So I'll go back even a little further because I um, I did some work with a lady named Dr. Kay Holkamp during my undergrad who researches spotted hyenas in Kenya. Okay. 
And um, I did some field work there and really loved it, but wanted something more conservation based. Yeah. So I sent George an email and um, he decided to kind of give me a trial period before saying that I um, could come on as his student, which is probably a good idea for anyone. So at that point I was um, still a research assistant and hoping to move into being a student. And I guess I passed whatever his test was because <laughs> now I'm a student here. But um, I think the reason that he brought me out in the first place is because I had had some experience in Kenya already. So that right. um, really gave me a leg up in terms of getting a chance. That's great. Thank you. And so how far are you now? Like, I mean. I'm in my fourth year. So I'm writing up my second chapter. I've been at a writing, virtual writing retreat all week. So my oh, brain's wow. a little foggy, but yeah hoping to graduate next year. And so in, in terms of, for um, for those of us that don't know what a PhD dissertation looks like, what does that mean for your second chapter? How does, what does that, what does that mean? So I have different um, components of my study. So um, dissertations are usually split up into chapters. So my whole dissertation is on the physiological condition of orphaned and non-orphan elephants. So basically health of orphans versus non-orphans. And then I'm looking at a different thing for each chapter. So my first chapter was um, parasite worm loads. And um, I counted worm eggs for that. I don't think I mentioned that before in the field. Um, and then my second chapter, I'm looking at demographic impacts of orphaning. So seeing if um, differences in orphan survival affect overall elephant population growth rate. Um, my third chapter will be looking at stress hormones. And then my final chapter will be looking at that bacteria in the gut because there is some study showing that stress impacts our gut bacteria. So we're interested to see if orphans um, have differing bacterial loads in their guts. Hmm. And so, I mean, sort of, I was just gonna, it wasn't even gonna be a pun. I was gonna say the elephant in the room um, but a kind of a looming question uh, around orphaning is like, what's driving the orphaning? Um, yeah, so in the, the population where I work, it was, um, there was a really bad drought in 2009. Okay. And then also poaching. So the biggest okay. thing we're interested in is poaching because ultimately our research is conservation oriented. So we just want to mm -hmm. kind of understand like these populations after the poaching has slowed, are there right. still impacts of that poaching that are carrying out for the for population growth? And so right. for example, orphans might who are stressed might um, have more trouble getting pregnant or having calves, or they might have shorter lifespans. So we're just trying to look at these more indirect lasting effects and see if there are any there. How many, um how many calves do elephants have at a time? One? One, very rarely two. Okay. Um, but that's extremely rare. And it's usually every four years and they have a gestation length of 22 months. So oh. that's- oh. <laughs> So they don't reproduce quickly. No. Which is no, why I'm don't. sure it's very important for wow. them to not be orphaned. Yes, yes, essentially. So what are the what are the other kind of interacting factors there? Because it's not as though it's like only elephants living in Samburu. There are lots of livestock, pastoral communities. I'm I'm imagining, right? Yeah. And so, like, what what's the interplay there? Do you kind of do you like dip your toe into that kind of discourse around kind of the human elephant um, as separate from poaching? You know, just like almost like competition for resources, that sort of thing. Yeah, well, my research will, like, orphaning also occurs from human-wildlife conflict as well, so my research deals with it in that way. But um, we partner with an organization called Save the Elephants, and mm. they deal a ton with human-wildlife conflict. Okay. Um, and it's good because there are community members or people who are actually from Kenya who deal more with that, which is, right. okay. I think, a good thing. And, I mean, I... Um, communicate my science to them and they help me and everything, but they're the ones dealing more with the actual human elephant conflict right. side of things. And there's actually a really, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna ask a separate question, so go for it. Oh, okay. 
there's just something that this lady named Dr. Lucy King does for a human wildlife conflict, or she started it, that I think is super cool. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Elephants and Bees project, but elephants are like... I have. Have you? I think yeah, so. Yeah, they're afraid of bees. So she came up yeah. with this ingenious solution that... Um, so they put these wires between two hives around crop fields because elephants will get into crops and it's a huge problem for farmers. And then if they hit that wire, it swings the beehives and the bees come out and then the elephants go away and it has like an 80% success rate of keeping them holy, out of the And then, yeah, and then the farmers can also sell the honey. So it's another source of income and it's just interesting. a really cool solution, I think. Yeah, you know what it was? Yeah, uh, crops and... Yeah, exactly. Is I read something that apparently elephants have a very specific noise that means, oh shoot, there's bees here. Let, yes. Let's leave. <laughs> yeah, they have like a specific noise for that. Okay, yeah, we gotta find that. We gotta find that now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So uh, my my Keep question. Talking. That I'm I was... gonna find the elephant bee sound. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question was, um, so, so sort of moving forward, you said that you you have analyzed some data or not yet. Yes. Um, right. Do you have any preliminary like findings from that? Yeah, so the parasite results were really unexpected and um, interesting. So some orphans remain with their family while others will leave their family and kind of join another family. Hmm. Um, and we found that orphans who have left have actually fewer parasites than non-orphans and orphans who've mm. stayed with their family. So my lab mates wanted me to call that chapter the benefits of bullying, but I decided <laughs> decided not to do that. But we think that the reason they have fewer parasites is because when they go live with another family, they're often kept on the outside. So they receive a bit more bullying as an anthropomorphic term and mm -hmm. so they're not we think it's because they're not exposed to the dung of other elephants as much that's infected with the larvae so there may be some benefits to being an orphan which hmm. is would be nice for them that seemingly um, are outweighing sort of the the social aspects of like not being with your kin right because i mean elephants are very oh, bonded I don't think animals it's probably outweighing it but yeah. um, at least it's there as a little little benefit maybe for them. Interesting. Um, yeah, because George's former student found that there are a lot of social costs for them because they're, um, they don't have as much access to matriarchs and older females and things like that. Hmm. And then sort of my next question was, um, how will you apply the findings of this towards these conservation efforts? It's, um, we kind of just are hoping that managers will be aware of these indirect impacts when they're considering, for example, whether to say whether a population has recovered or whether they still maybe need to have extra protection. And then in Kenya, they don't allow hunting, but in other countries like Tanzania and Botswana, um, they allow some hunting of adults. And so it would be good for us to understand if there are adverse consequences to that hunting for the elephants who are left behind just because they're um, very socially complex like humans. Mm. Mm. So you're writing your chapters, which usually comes towards the end of a PhD. Um, so what's next? Um, so I've started. I know it's a horrible question. No, it's okay. I think I know what's next, I hope. So <laughs> it's an okay question. Um, so George's former student, Dr. Schiffer Goldenberg, who I mentioned, I've been doing a little bit of side work with her and the San Diego Zoo Global. Um, they're working with rewilding some orphan elephants in Kenya. And so I'm hoping to have kind of a postdoctoral position with them. Um, At the San Diego Zoo? Um, that's where it would be based, but I would be doing a lot of field work in Kenya because there's a called Riteti Elephant Orphanage, where um, the community is has set up an orphanage for elephants to be released into the wild and um, save the elephants. And San Diego Zoo already has some newly released ones collared and things, but I hope to do some behavioral and more physiological research on how those elephants fare once they're released. That's amazing. Yeah, that sounds so cool. Oh, thank you. That's like... <laughs> 
that's like a character in a story, you know, like, oh, I, you know, I work at the San Diego Zoo, but that's just where I'm based because most of my work is remote and we're rewilding elephants and I don't know. I have been very, very lucky. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, I hope that works out. And then we'll have you back on the show. And you can tell us. <laughs> okay. Like a San, you can have like a San Diego Zoo badge. <laughs> that was like that was like my dream job as a kid was definitely to get to be a not not be a zookeeper but do essentially what you just described it was like work at a zoo but then do a lot of like field work you so, should come along yeah right that would <laughs> you be need, awesome. do you need an assistant that's right yeah. <laughs> i need two <laughs> hey all right perfect okay it's settled um okay so we should say we should plug at least what's your connection to sojus Mm. Yeah. So I've been um, a sustainability leadership fellow for the past year, and it's actually been really beneficial and helped me, like you had mentioned, with the blog writing and communicating to different types of audiences. Okay. I received a lot of training on that. Um, there was a, we had a um, couple day retreat with journalists where we learned how to communicate with the press and um, we learned some tips on communicating with audiences who are skeptical of science and um, just a lot of really useful things. And I've become way more productive because there was training on time budgeting and things. So oh, wow. um, I'm really grateful to so just for um, allowing me to be a part of that. It was very helpful for, sure. for me. So, so thank okay, you guys. So, <laughs> yeah. We it was it was totally me and Micah. So yep. welcome. we made that all happen. Yeah. <laughs> I made mean, that um, run that program. Well, thank you for no being connected deal. to the people who made it happen. I hope Alita, who is in charge of the program, is not watching right now. Um, but uh, so okay, so you do something that is about, and I'm I'm grateful that there has been no ugly crying yet. But you, you study orphaned elephants. And uh, you st which is in large part due to poaching, which is sort of, I mean, I know people need to make money and eat and blah, 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 but poaching is still a pretty gnarly thing to do. Um, so you're in a, you're in a, a field or kind of a, a, you're studying something in the sustainability world that I bet can sometimes feel a little hopeless. So what's something though that gives you hope, like that drives you to keep doing this, that you want to, that motivates you to like keep working in this area that is a little bit sad? Yeah, um, the, the, the population is actually recovering quite well. And there are just certain elephants whose personalities give me hope. So there are some elephant adults who just have the slew of orphans following them all the time. So they just kind of let the orphans join their family. Um, and only specific females do that, which I think is really interesting. And I'd like to do further study on that, but just, um, I don't know if the, if you, it's very anthropomorphic to say this, but I guess the, the seeming compassion of some of the elephants gives me hope. And the fact that this population is, um, recovering and there's been research showing that they can rebuild social ties mm -hmm. so like orphans will sometimes join the family of um, families that their mother was close with and they kind of rejoin and make new groups and um, wow. so there is quite a bit of resilience and um, poaching has really slowed now the problem is in many parts of Africa is more the human wildlife conflict you had alluded to with population growth and habitat destruction. Um, so that's hopeful as well too, is that there has been success in many areas of Africa and bringing poaching down. So that's good. That is good. Hmm. Yeah. That's a great thing. Yeah. Well, Mike, do you have any other questions? I don't, actually, yes, I have one kind of very random question. You had mentioned okay. that, um, the like the elephant society is a, a matriarchal society. Mm -hmm. um, I I guess I maybe did learn that a while ago. Um, is is that unique in a wildlife setting, or or there are other animal populations that are matriarchal, or in like how does that I don't know affect affect the way they interact? There are some others. I think killer whales are matriarchal and. Um spotted hyenas mm -hmm. um, and um, some others. So it's, so what happens is the males 
and it varies anywhere from the age of five to 18 in our population, they'll start dispersing. And um, so for a few years, they'll kind of hang pretty close to the family and then eventually just kind of really disperse away from the family. Hmm. Um, so it's really, um, populations are really centered around female families because the daughters stay with their mothers their whole lives. And hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and yeah. the families are led by females. I think bonobos are matriarchal too. I think so too. I just read that some chimpanzees, like the males are the ones who stay and the females disperse, which I found really interesting. So I chimpanzees? Don't know about bonobos. Chimpanzee. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Any other? I'm trying to see if I did any more. That was my journalism was pretty shallow. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, okay, so. Any final parting words of wisdom, Jenna? Well, we, we didn't ask her the, the, the standard final question. We should probably ask you. What, oh, is, oh what has been um, uh, oh, yeah. something that has, you know, so we're all working remote and we're living through some very uncertain and unprecedented times. Uh, those are two Completely. words that I think I've heard more than any other two words in the last two months. Um, what is, or how do you phrase it, Pat? I can't remember. Okay, so what's something, let's see, I think I wrote it down so that I wouldn't forget. Um, what is a remarkable, hopefully good thing that has happened during this crazy time? For me specifically or? For you specifically. For and it specifically. doesn't have to be related to your work. Okay, it kind of is. I'm a lot more productive because I'm not wanting to go and talk to everyone else in my <laughs> lab and things and can't be as social anymore so i'm getting a yeah, lot right. more done which i guess that's is good, really good but... when you're in the chapter writing phase that's for sure yeah yeah i'd yeah. i'd rather have it not be this way but i guess if you have to look at a bright side then sure yeah productivity yeah. but at what cost <laughs> exactly <laughs> my sanity yeah, right. yeah. okay well, well jenna it's been Oh, I was going to say, we're glad you're making progress on your chapters and um, oh, thank congratulations you. on on getting near the end of this um, yeah. long process, I'm sure. Thank and you. And for lining something for up potentially me. afterwards. Yeah. 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 Oh, thanks. Yeah. But yes, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to following up with you in the future uh, where you're at some like exotic locale. And uh, okay. <laughs> maybe we'll be, maybe you won't be like, elbow deep in a dung pile, but maybe you'll be like, <laughs> after that. There's a good chance um, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that makes for great TV. It's great, yeah, it's great TV, <laughs> perfect. That's exactly it. Well, thank you so much, Jenna, for okay, joining us. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jenna, bye. Bye. Okay, so with that, let's try and, well, we keep uh, trying to be at the 40 minute time point and we're almost there, we're two minutes away, so we probably won't make it. But we're going to try. We're going to so try. We, we do have some announcements, though, to make. Yeah. Um, but before we get to those, I'm sad oh. that there wasn't any ugly crying. I was really Yeah, well, I to held that. in. And also, I'm, we didn't talk as much. Like, if, if she had then brought, like, slides of, mm, of orphan elephants. elephants. And, like, the one that's, like, wandering around the grassy plain, like, sad and maybe trumpeting a little, uh, that would have made me ugly cry. OK. okay. I'm not trying to make you ugly cry right now. I'm just saying, like, those are the things. Um, there has and to I was be gonna, some emotional value to this live stream, you know. People, want I guess, to see, there does. People want to see behind the curtain. Okay, all right. This is a. Sp I shouldn't be telling you this. Um, show, show me up the film, <laughs> and actually, really, just the first ten minutes. Yeah. Although, like the whole movie, um, and the ugly crying. There's going to be a lot of yeah. crying with up. Um, almost, yeah, pretty much any Pixar movie. Actually, yeah, they know how to do it. They know, they know how, how to, to do that. The like, come on. Going. Um, Anyways, and we do I, have a few announcements. Right. Should, should yes. I go into that? Yes, please. Okay. Um, our Global Challenges research teams and our resident fellows each year at the SOGES Spring Open House will generally display summaries of their research. Um, and unfortunately, this year, we can't have our Spring Open House, but we have done a virtual display. And so there's a page on the website, um, uh, sustainability.colostate.edu slash virtual showcase where you yep. can go and view these um, infographic type uh, presentations and learn all about what our GCRTs and our resident fellows have been doing. Um, so make so sure you check out that. 
How, how do you get there from the main page? Um, it actually it's on a slider. So go down. Oh. Um, okay. So it'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, Let's see, is it that one? It's not that one. It's that one, hey. right there. Okay, it's the second one on the slider. Click view the gallery. Yep. There we go. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, be sure to check out that. There's some really interesting oh, projects on there. Um, and when you click on them, they expand, so they get a little bit bigger. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, okay, and what's then next? the only other announcement, well, actually I have two more announcements. Um, we recently put up a new piece on the SoJust Together Apart page, and that's where we're um, aggregating articles and posting content about the connections of COVID-19 to sustainability. Right. Um, I did a Q&A with Emily Fisher from the Atmospheric Science Department, um, and the Q&A is up on the page, and it's really quite interesting. Um, she went into quite a bit of detail on some of my questions about what an atmospheric perspective can teach us about COVID-19. Um, and actually, Jacob Lindis, who, ha who we had on the show last week, um, helped contribute to some of those answers. Oh, great. Um, so it's a little longer re read, but it is very interesting. Perfect. And then um, finally, we mentioned the graduation and our GES and um, SOGES minors. Uh, but we also want to take a minute to say um, congratulations and goodbye, and we'll miss you to this year's cohort of Sustainability Leadership Fellows. Um, right, so you that's can, what Jenna was one of those. Yeah, yep. Um, so we've got all their pictures up on the homepage as well. Um, and if you know any of them, make sure to give them a shout out. Uh, they've done a lot of work with the program this year for this science communication training. Um, and we're going to miss all of them. And we also have the new ones up, right? We have the new ones up. That is so correct. This is another button on the slider. Um, wait, this is this is last year's, right? Do we have the new the new group up yet? Mm, maybe we don't yet. No, maybe we don't have them. Well, you can look at all the the current the current cohort. Hey, here's Jacob. Um, there's Jenna, and then we're gonna have the new cohort up soon uh, because there's all sorts of great new people that are gonna be joining us in the SLF program this coming year. Yeah. All right. How'd we do? Is that it. Where's our forty minute mark? Okay. Okay. We'll wrap it up. Um, so just to remind you, this is the sustainability happy hour. Also known as shh. Um, but tell your friends if they want to come hang out on a Friday afternoon. And um, I'm Pat from Sojus. And I'm Micah from Sojus. And we will be here probably in two more weeks. I think we're going to do an uh, every other week schedule um, not to burn everybody out. It's true. Well, thank you for joining us this week, and we will see you next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.